Inclusive Leadership, the essential component for inclusive and accessible technology. Hashtag Talking Inclusive Leadership. Steve Tyler, Director of Assistive Technology at Leonard Cheshire. Caroline Casey, Founder of the Valuable 500. Okay, great. So, um, so yes, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are joining us from. So my name is Saku and I'm the Director of Asian at Leonard Cheshire. Welcome everyone to our quarterly fireside chat on essential components for inclusive and accessible technology. Uh, so this is part of a series of discussions organized by Lena Cheshire to explore the potential of technology to support people with disabilities live, learn um, and earn independently. So before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping instructions. Um, international Sign Language is the interpreters will be pinned to the screen. Live English caption is available, but also uh, posted in the chat. The session will be recorded and a link will be shared after the event with all of you. And please also use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. There will be time at the end of the discussions to answer questions. We are hoping to have about 20 minutes. So with that sort of like, you know, uh, housekeeping instructions. Um, so before I hand over to Steve and Caroline, let me just sort of give a bit of an overview and also introduce the speakers who probably don't need any introduction because they're very well known in the sector. Uh, so today's session is titled Inclusive Leadership, the Essential Component for Inclusive and Accessible Technology. So the last 12 months has shown us how technology is not only a game changer, but also an essential component of everyday life. We need to ensure that it works for everyone and not only some of the people. In fact, the potential technology offers to address barriers faced by people with disabilities is tremendous. So if we know this, what is holding us back? And today we have two distinguished, uh, distinguished speakers who will uh, well known in the disability sector to talk about the role of inclusive leadership plays to make inclusive and accessible technology a game changer. So Steve Tyler has a history of innovating sustainable and life-changing products in the accessibility arena. This includes leading the team that developed groundbreaking synthetic speech leading to the voice of Alexa right through to accessible TV devices, online web and app accessibility initiatives. At Leonard Cheshire, Steve is responsible for policy support and implementation of assistive technology solutions, services, and innovations. Caroline Casey is an award-winning social entrepreneur, leader of the Valuable 500, a catalyst for an in inclusion revolution that exists to position disability equally on the global business leadership agenda. The Valuable 500 is a campaign to get 500 businesses to commit to put disability inclusion on their leadership agendas. Caroline is also a TED speaker, fellow Eisenhower fellow, a past advisor for the Clinton Global Initiative, a young a world counselor, is a um, um, young world counselor and is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. So with such Two sort of great speakers we have. I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to hand over to Steve and Caroline, who will be discussing in the next 35 to 40 minutes inclusive leadership. And then uh, about a quarter past um, the hour, we will sort of get into the QA discussion. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Saku, and welcome everybody. And thanks for uh, spending some of what I know is your valuable time with us today. Hopefully we'll make it worthwhile. You never know uh, because, you know, I've been tasked with um, leading on questions and uh, keeping the discussion going. Not difficult for me as a rule. And if anything, uh, you know, things move into places that we didn't expect. So I'll desperately try today to keep us on track. Um, needless to say, I think this area is a very live challenge at the moment. You know, lots of you will know about the power of technology and I don't need to wax too lyrical about that and how over the past 20 years, 
our lives have all been dramatically affected by it. You know, if you simply, you only have to think about your online transactions, you know, 30% in the UK, 40% in the US of all online retail transactions are now through Amazon. Um, and it has really changed the way in which we interact and has led the way around benchmarking what it is to do online shopping, but also what it is to consume video and books. And gradually, without necessarily realizing quite what happened, we've begun to expect things that 15 or 20 years ago we didn't expect. And now we're really quite impatient. We expect immediacy. Uh, if things don't happen exactly when we want and our on-demand Netflix proposition doesn't work, well, you know, woe betide whoever's in the way of that. And so much of our lives are mediated through these, you know, the social media. What we're doing today um, is astonishing when you think about it. Reliant very much on the opportunities that these technologies afford. Um, are people with disabilities. Built right into the heart of these things um, is the need for accessibility. And without it, um, we'd be nowhere. So the opportunities are enormous. The challenges of doing it sometimes are big. Failure to do it means that people with disabilities are completely locked out, locked out of citizenship, locked out of employment opportunity. And the decision makers, those who hold the cards around how this stuff plays out in the end, really are held by a few people with very great influential power. And Caroline tangles with a number of these guys. So Caroline, perhaps to start off, um, I think it's fair to say that diversity and inclusion uh, is more and more on agenda on the agenda of, of, of larger organizations still a bit of an afterthought um, in many respects could you tell us a little bit about what valuable 500 has been doing to change employers attitudes um, around inclusion and what's the current status would you say of the campaign um yeah i love that word tangled up with them <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was wondering, are you saying, uh, am I tangled up with them or doing the tango with them, which I think <laughs> is probably a bit of both. So just really, I guess the reason the Valuable 500 was created, um, you know, we're all in this space a long time and we haven't seen accelerated change on the global inclusion of people with disabilities. Um, we haven't seen that happen um, in a way that you would expect with the scale of an issue that touches 15 to 20% of our population and with a mother and a father, that's 70%. And so why on earth is, are we not seeing the accelerated change? And I think one of um, my passions has always been since I've been in this uh, in the world of disability business inclusion is because business hadn't been meaningfully engaged. And I mean, really meaningfully engaged in the way it has been in other issues. And, and, that, and I don't understand why that is true. Um, but what we do understand is there are great pockets and examples of disability business inclusion. And these businesses are not just employers. They are, they are big brands. They are huge supply chains. They engage with customers. Um, and we know there's some really good best practice been happening and it's been happening for decades, but we're not seeing it scaled and we're not seeing it integrated. And you're absolutely right. Disability has remained on the sidelines of the diversity and inclusion agenda. When I began my, my whole journey into this space, I remember writing off to companies in Ireland, asking them to back an idea I had. And they were like, no, we don't do disability. Now that was in 2001. I mean, like, what do you mean you don't do disability? And before we launched um, the Valuable 500, we had a big campaign called Hashtag Valuable. And what we heard at that time was, oh yes, we, we do have disability on our agenda, but it ain't our priority because this year we're prioritizing on something else. And so let me just give you a stat, which is the real reason the Valuable 500 was formed, is 90% of our companies are very public about being passionate about you know, inclusion and diversity, but only 4% consider disability. So that's the stat that you're talking about, Steve. That is an inclusion delusion. And just in case we're worried that that has maybe exponentially changed in the last 18 months, it hasn't. 
In 2020, 3% of the publications for diversity and inclusion in the corporate world, 3% mentioned the word disability. <laughs> Seriously. So that is the real premise the Valuable 500 was set up. It was set up to ensure that disability was equal was in the inclusion, belonging, well-being, diversity agendas. And why we set it up and why it was called the Valuable 500 is because we knew the only way that we could potentially achieve this was if we got the leadership, the attention and the intention and the accountability of those big companies, CEOs. And what we knew before we launched was 54% of our global big brands and businesses had never had a conversation about disability. So how on earth were we ever going to change the, the reality if we didn't get their attention and intention and stop them simply delegating it and putting it into one department under the auspice of HR when it should be looking at the extraordinary opportunity that this community of which I am a member of, of which you are a member of, can bring into insight, innovation, growth, plan differentiation, talent, customer, I do not understand. And that's why we called it the Valuable 500. We are valuable to business as a community. We have something to offer. And who we need to see that is 500 of the world's most influential CEOs. And that was the campaign. We wanted to break the CEO silence. We launched it two years ago. As of this morning, we're at 449 <laughs> companies, which represents 18 million employees, 37 countries, 64 sectors, and the power of 7 trillion. So that's where we are. That's why. And, and then, you know, just to say, Steve, we started as a campaign and I thought that was going to be good enough, but we never really admitted that we were going to always be more than a campaign. We wanted to build the world's first CEO right. global community for change. which is what Exactly. We're and you and I are uh, working together on, if you like, the translation of yeah. that, if you like, <laughs> agenda that 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 buy-in from the ceo and leadership level hey actually turned that into real tangible progress have you seen i mean whether it's geographic or legislative or cultural is there anything at all across the globe that you've seen that really is an influencer either in positive terms or negative around you know adoption of your message well i first of all it's not mine we all did this together i just want to be really clear the valuable 500 is like this incredible ecosystem spread out around the world we have multiple friends and partners all everywhere around the world because this is not you know we have to have design we want to design this system in direct relationship with the disability community with leadership and intelligence and innovation and insight from from the disability community so for me, where I see the best examples of where it's taken up are the companies that are constantly in direct relationship or communication with partners who represent the disability community or have a really good relationship or certainly trying to have a better relationship with their employees. And there are organizations where you see the ERG groups that have executive sponsorship, where you're seeing the voice of people with disabilities in the business contributing to what the strategy around disability business inclusion is um the examples where we see is like i mean come on you're like let's be honest steve you're a bit of a genius right so you know you're a genius in the sense that you're passionate about accessible technology you have a lived experience but i'm guessing you know yourself the companies and the innovations that you've seen scale and do really well is when there was leadership from the top of that business as well you know and so look I can't deny it. I sit on, on the Diversity um, Advisory Council for Sky and I what I'm really intrigued at by an organization like Sky, who I would have known for years, who've really tried to look at, um, at the disability space and to move it forward in a meaningful way, in a strategic way, is they are taking what I think is that new approach to diversity and inclusion, which is not about siloing us into uh, gender and race and LGBTQ and disability and age. It's they're trying to take a comprehensive, holistic, intersectional, I'm using air comment wave things, um, and trying to look at that and how they're doing that 
is speaking to their business and speaking to their customers. And that to me is a new way of going forward because it's talking about accessibility for all. For I love all. that. Thank you. Um, uh, to those points, um, just translating some of that into, I guess, the technology solutions that we're seeing. Um, well, Zoom, <laughs> you know, yeah. Zoom is a great example where accessibility has been baked in from the get go and they take it seriously. Microsoft has changed the face now of yeah. um, what it is to be accessible and to deliver on an accessible workplace. And that, to your point, has at least partially been delivered through that acceptance holistically that that simple premise on one level, if you represent the world you live in through diversity of your employees, then by definition, what becomes possible is that you begin quite naturally in some senses to deliver on accessibility. If the guy next to you can't understand the code that you've just written at Microsoft, that's telling you there's a bit of a problem and exponentially external to, to, to Microsoft itself, of course. And that, you know, I, 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 I'm seeing that happen more and more. The technologies that are becoming, uh, that are already available and are becoming um, real game changers in the workplace, um, almost these days for an office-based job, there's very little to stop an employer recruiting a person with a disability from a technical point of view. The challenge is always, you know, how do you make sure that they've got the right kit, the right support around them, etc. But these are not tricky issues anymore. These are very well understood. And we've got the wonders of the World Wide Web. I did want to touch on that. There's a, having said all of these wonderful things, and of course, a, those of you who know me uh, wax lyrical endlessly about the game-changing nature of technology that if we get it right um, it really does make changes that for people with disabilities are just enormous you know today um, the likes of I and Caroline can access virtually any book you want to access, read any newspaper, travel independently, buy your own tickets, know which train is leaving from where and whether it's delayed and what platform it's on. You know, these endless examples which seem ridiculous on one level, these are things that people do every day of their lives. Um, and yet, through the mediation of technology, you know, we, we, we've, we've managed to deliver accessible ecosystems that have brought brought these things about. The really sad thing, and I would encourage you all to look at the very latest WebAIM uh, findings, W-E-B-A-I-M. If you Google that, it will come up. And one of the saddest things is, firstly, the exponential growth of the web um, and the importance to all of us. I mean, I talked earlier about shopping and retailing and banking and all of these things that everybody does. Citizenship, enormously important, mediated through the web. And the disgrace, I'm afraid, is that accessibility is a very, very poor cousin indeed. The exponential growth of the web has simply not been uh, accompanied by the exponential growth of accessibility. And that really does mean people are completely locked out. But it, um, and Steve, the, can I just say it's what it's ludicrous. It's not just sad. It's ludicrous, isn't it? It's like we've been building a, a big house around the world. Like I'm going to not talk tech for a second. It's like the web is a huge house that we've not thought about who's going to come into the house and who's going to live in the house. And we've decided not to talk to and design in the mind of, you know, over I don't know, 15 to 20% of the people who could come into the house. And what I find extraordinary is that when you're, you know, you've been in this space a long time, that accessibility as an idea was considered as something niche, not normal. That actually when we're designing anything, houses, furniture, the World Wide Web, technology, who are we designing this for? Like we're designing it for human beings. And I, I'm amazed when I hear about some of the stuff that you've done over the years. And it's like, you know, of course, when you talk about Alexa, 
I mean, I don't have Alexa. That's just because I don't have Alexa. But everybody uses Alexa. We, we were talking to Sarah Harlinger yesterday, right, from Apple. And she was saying, you know, the way they design an Apple, which let's be honest, has just proved that it's one of the most successful companies in the world. It was designing for its customers, not for certain customers, for all of its customers. And she said she gets this great joy out of it that when she, they're not, when that she sees that people who are visually impaired are the experts in teaching other people how to use the iPhone. You know, there's something exciting about that. Like people like you are not just designing for visually impaired or people with disabilities, you're designing for all of us. The way you consider and you see and you understand technology is that you see it oddly better than anybody because from your extreme experience, you're having a more holistic ability for all of us to be included. And how we are still having this conversation, right, is extraordinary. But I do think COVID is changing it. I think COVID is changing it because we've all had to look at, I actually have found the COVID experience as being a visually impaired person, incredibly difficult. I've had to come out nearly every day on this on platforms to say, I can't see, I know I look, I can see, I can't get involved in chat, I can't moderate like I used to do on the stage. And, you know, it's like, I think everybody is realizing this isn't an issue like you know captioning is not about people who are hard of hearing it's about all of us how could a president of our countries go on television without captioning isn't it isn't it isn't it crazy right is it now do you think we're at the stage where we're all going oh my gosh what were we ever doing i uh, so much agree with you <laughs> just taking the apple example um on one level it's a kind of simple message that apparently many people find difficult to translate. But the simple proposition from Apple on one level was, we're going to make the best product on the planet yeah. for everybody. Yeah. And that means everybody. And if it means everybody, that means you. And, I, and what we're therefore going to do is to make it... Um, the most accessible proposition that exists. And it almost came about because of that embracing of the customer and what the customer wants and being in particular customers' shoes and understanding how that translation could work. And in the end, um, you know, the story tells itself. If you look at the adoption of yes. Apple products by yeah. the disability community, despite the fact that there are significantly cheaper propositions on the market and more ubiquitous. But Apple is the go to place, not only because it's accessible, but actually because it's one of the sexiest products on the planet yeah, that so everybody beautiful. else has. Yes, exactly. It's beautiful. And so it was designed for all of us. But what I think the critical one of the critical su success factors was whether you like Steve Jobs or not. OK, that was leadership right in his 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 entrepreneurial brain is is exactly that dna of design beautiful design for everyone right that's what he felt and that's in the culture of the business and so the leadership ensured upon that now if you think of some of the let's look at satya nadella he has a chief accessibility officer in jenny lay flurry that means accessibility is right at board level salesforce when they, yeah at microsoft sorry when salesforce joined the valuable 500 Mark Benioff looked at what Satya Nadella was doing and we're going, OK, if I'm going to take this seriously, I need to have a chief accessibility officer and they're positioned in a leadership position. So I think what's exciting for me now, or I choose to be excited because honestly, COVID has brought the gross inequity and injustice into our world and how unbalanced everything is. People with disabilities have hugely suffered and yet are for me, how we move out of this and how we change this is the technology is there, isn't it? The timing yeah. is right, but you know what the difference is? It's the will and intention now. This is about will and intention. No more excuses. We don't need to make the case for people with disabilities in business. We don't even need to make the case for people with disabilities and why it's important that all of our society reaches their potential. That's ridiculous. This is about will and intention. And I really think we have shown or COVID has shown that we can no longer choose parts and segments of society to which we invest in. We come in as multiple layers of a human being and we need to make space for us all. And there is enough pie for all. And if I give to you, I don't take away from myself. But this, the leadership in business 
who represents the society we're in, which need to be accountable. I want choice. to. I, I want no. I want to come back to the COVID thing towards in in a second because I think you're absolutely right. How we utilise the learning from COVID and how that informs some of our messages and 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 engagement. I think it's, it's a gift on one level. It sounds ridiculous to say that, <laughs> because you know the 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 absolute excruciating nightmare that COVID is across the world and the costs in life and so on. But actually, if there is a saving grace out of COVID, it is that we pick up the learning from it. And I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, you know, at Leonard Cheshire, you know, as part of the the the, the I to I work and 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 mm -hmm. much else that we do, you know, we've utilised technology either as a mainstream proposition, but and and building in kind of accessibility from the get go, or uh, utilising technology to profile people with disabilities, link them into opportunities like employment and education, begin to build. AI driven systems that are looking at I'm like, how, do, how do we maximize the opportunity for a person with a disability? How do we use the power of the web, the power of opportunities that exist, bring those together and link the profile of that individual to the opportunities that they might embrace or, you know, the kind of skills that they could adopt if they want to go further with their lives. And to your point, um, we can't, you almost can't, uh, you, you, there is no better proposition in a way than you, we've been working with with, with um, some of our clients more recently on communication and some of the specialist communication technology and those people that struggle to communicate in a standard way. And um, in, in some cases where we've had uh, people who have been diagnosed uh, uh, have diagnosis for 17 years uh, with who, who are told that they're non-communicative with with new technologies and new propositions we find that after an hour actually they're very communicative it's just that they didn't have a way of doing it and one of the really really basic messages that I've used unscrupulously recently is so here we are we've all experienced these issues for ourselves over the past year, social distancing, not being able to see friends and family, being isolated. Imagine that for 40 years. Imagine that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And we, we, we've struggled with what we've got. And these are, this is the power and the, the harnessing of technology and the wherewithal to do it. I want to ask you, from your point of view, if you had a magic wand, if you could, <laughs> You know, what needs to happen, what is the critical piece that needs to happen at leadership uh, level to really push the dial around inclusion? What well, do okay. CEOs need to do? What do, what do they need to do to get buy-in? with the rest of their organizations. Well, they first got to go, over, they have to get over themselves. I think this is one of the things, um, Jeff Dodds, who is the COO of Virgin Media, um, and the, I'm, I'm going to steal his line, like get over yourself as a leader. <laughs> and the reason he says this is, look, you know what? This is about human beings for starters, and you do not need to know everything and you don't need to be an expert in accessibility or disability business inclusion. You need to get out of the way for starters, support people in your business who do know, or if there aren't people in your business, buy into that expertise and invest in that space and admit that you don't know. The most important thing a leader, if we wanna change this, the leaders that are good at it need to speak about it. The leaders who have a direct connection to disability need to talk to it. 7% of our C-suite, of our leaders, have a lived experience of disability, but four out of five of them are not identifying. Now, I was in the closet with my sight loss in business for, for 11 years. I only came out of the disability closet when I was 28 years old because it was so exhausting trying to be somebody you are in the hope that you might fit in because for fear, that actually somebody wouldn't treat you that way. Now, 
21 years later, 7% of our, our leaders and four out of five of them are hiding it. Now, what is that saying about how they, their relationship to disability? That but happens, you, by the way, too, in 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 in, in our own recruitment experience. Well, well, as, as a voluntary sector organisation, a disability organisation where people cannot bring themselves to admit or acknowledge uh, that they have a disability because, and with a very good <laughs> experiential reasons, actually yeah. quite often it's a negative experience to do well, so. Because it was for me, and, 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 and I, I'm not judging anybody who doesn't, that what we're saying is the reason it's happening is because disability isn't welcomed. The idea that we're defined by having a physical impairment that actually determines who we are and what we bring to the table. But if leaders are doing that at the top of the business and they're not making the culture of the organization um, welcoming and open and a place for people to truly belong as their unique selves, that is the most important part of any of this because I keep going back to it. None of this is rocket science, Steve. None of it's rocket science. It's the six inches between our ears. It's about people saying, I don't know enough, so I'm going to know more. It's about saying, I'm not happy with what I'm doing now, but I commit and I intend to do better. And I think the next most important thing is talk to people with disabilities. We know that in our businesses and in our organizations, that actually it's most likely that 11 to 15% of our employees have a lived experience of disability or connected to it because 80% of disability is invisible because most of our cultures don't make it comfortable for us to, uh, comfortable enough for us to come out. So we need to, the leaders need to go into their employee base and say, what do you want us to do? How can we be a better employer? How can we be a better customer? And I think that's the piece that I desperately want because the solutions are there. The intelligence is there. The technology is there. And it's not, it shouldn't be peaceful. It needs to be mainstream. And I love the way that you said Apple is sexy. Do you know, because actually I love when I see the younger generation of people with disabilities using technology in a way that I really wish I had. And they are talking about disability pride. When I was 19 years old, I didn't see that. I, I didn't see what that looked like. I didn't see those role models. I didn't see people who had disabilities in the front cover of magazines. and. And that's the new kind of energy. I that, hope. That's such an interesting it. observation. I, I, uh, what, in fact, it plays to one of my fears that we also need. You know, sometimes I worry. You know, that accessibility is still uh, and has been hard fought. You know, and yeah. to keep that level up is very, very difficult. One of my fears is that we're not doing enough potentially for the younger generation or, or encouraging the younger generation of people with disabilities coming through to recognize how hard fought that was. And okay. that actually the biggest consequence of losing the wins that we've made would have a direct impact on them. They don't necessarily know it because now they're born into a world where this stuff is accessible. Happy days. But it took some doing and it keeps taking some doing and until we embed and just to some of your points earlier there um for me you know the technology i often say you know technology that are, is, a, is, a, is a, are a set of tools or a set of products and proposition that help you live your life i mean in and of itself you can make accessible technology but you know does it actually do the job or is it helping you deliver and a lot of it is tied up with the customer journey and viewing the customer and one of the ways that i tend to think about this stuff is taking that very customer centric approach um, because that really often is the key it seems to me whether you're a ceo or a when you think about the organization if you think about its customers as we all are and even internal customers and the way the operation the, the organization operates it seems to me that helps you track how you're doing. So through HR processes, put a lens around disability and diversity on those. Are you mitigating against people even thinking about your organization or the adoption of your property portfolio? Are you building in accordance with current standards? Or when you buy a property, are you thinking at all about the accessibility for people of all kinds that might come to visit or come to work for yeah. you? When you buy technology, have you any idea at all about the nature of the people that you're employing and and the kind of people that you're going to and it goes on but the 
the hallmark, it seems to me, of a great organization is one that embraces diversity and thinks customer, 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 thinks of all of us and the people it employs and the mm -hmm. engagement with us. Um, we've got only four minutes left. I want to go back to the pandemic. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned learning around the pandemic and, and, and yeah. the kind of opportunities that it might afford us and how it's affected all of us. Um, are, are there things that you're picking up, behaviours that you're picking up that you've been able yeah. to utilise around, you know, some of the agenda that we have uh, around disability and inclusion? Yeah, I think um, there's a few things. Um... <laughs> One is I finally think we might be starting to use our heads and our hearts in, in equal measure. I, I do, you know, I really do. Um, and I think somehow this pandemic has shown us the dark side of humanity um, and another side, the, the beautiful side. And I think, Absolutely. Going, yes. I think we're going through a decade of, I keep calling it the decade of disruption. I think I like a literal oration, but I really do believe there is a push in us to be more human centered in our business. And so on that, what we're starting to see emerge in our valuable 500 community and outside is this. So there's a few expressions from last year. One is you're on mute, which we know, but the other one is the word <laughs> intersectionality. And that simply means all that we're so much more than one label. I am a woman and I have a disability. So which part of the business, which part of me does the business want to deal with? Well, now they're seeing they need to, to deal with it all. So we're starting to see an integrated, more intersectional approach where you cannot, there is not tolerance, um, you know, to just pick one part from the other. More collaboration, um, more connectivity. I mean, we're yearning for connectivity, but the collaboration is we know, like, so Leonard Cheshire and, and Valuable 500, Valuable 500 and IPC, IPC and IDA, um, we're all starting to talk to each other. The formulation of the Valuable 500 is based on community. It's based on community that we have to do this together. We have to share. We can't believe that if I give to you, I take away from myself. The other right. piece that I would say that I really do think I'm getting excited about is we're looking at integrating disability. It's not a standalone, it's not outside of, it's within. And, I, and I'm really excited when we, as a Valuable 500, are getting requests from our Valuable 500 companies please give us access to people within the community who can come into our business. They want to talk to the community. It's not through somebody else anymore. And the big game changer is when we expose people who have a lived experience with the people in power, then we get some chance of change. Because guess what we know? We're human beings. We're all human beings. And where some positions in the world may be more important than the other, there is no human life on this wor world that is mo more important than the other. A position may be, a president of a country, fine, but I'm sorry, but you and I are no less important than the president of a country. So I think there's something that's happening. There's an energy that I, 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 I hope we can embrace, but I, I really believe as we move forward, please let us learn as we design this new world, the voice of the disability community in all its regards must be there as part of the architecture and redesign of our world, not as an afterthought, but now. And the only way that I understand how we do that is you, I, and everybody else need to join our dots together because together we actually are louder because we do represent such a huge part of our world, which everybody is going to be part of our club at some point. Now, you see, you forced me into this because uh, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't going to say this. But now that you've said what you've said, um, I, I, I would absolutely echo that. I would echo it very strongly with regard to the not for profit sector and the voluntary sector organisations of which I'm a part, because actually I, I think there's this kind of strange uh, perception, I guess, that says, oh, you know, if you come to a voluntary sector organization or a charity or whatever, you know, everyone's a bit more fluffy and furry there and, and they want to help and support and do good stuff. I'm here to tell you that actually they're as cutthroat as everybody else when it comes to, we are, uh, uh, when it comes to fundraising and branding and, and, and all of those things. We, as a voluntary sector uh, set of entities need to do exactly that collaboration with each other and it was never 
better said actually and this is a genuine this is not a made up story it's a true one three or four weeks ago a parent um sorry grandparent of of, of a child that i know said um oh, and my granddaughter came home and it was fantastic you know uh they're they're doing this fundraising thing for water aid and i thought oh you know obviously yeah let's get behind that and there are a whole bunch of things that they had to do to make that happen and his observation was but don't get me wrong i'm absolutely delighted that they're doing that um it's just that i remember doing fundraising for water aid 50 years ago and my obvious question is what happened what has happened in those 50 years and i think one of the challenges for all of us has been quite often we get hooked by funding by programs and projects which have a beginning and an end but we lose sight of the big picture we lose sight of the holistic view of what is it we want to do we want in this case to change the game for people with disabilities we want together to make the world a better place for people with disabilities that requires embracing big vision and chunking it up into holistic stuff that we all get behind and work and never more important it seems to me um, has been the collaboration both in the business sector but also across the voluntary sector and at this point I and you both need to shut up because otherwise Saku will shout at us and we now go back to her for uh, questions from the floor if there are any thank you thanks and see you that was a, a very impressive conversation that i wouldn't have stopped you know so i <laughs> could have carried on uh, and um, we got a couple of questions and maybe i'm sure like you know during that there would be sort of others coming through they are so maybe let me pause um one to steve and one to caroline so steve a building on what you were talking about um when you were ending so how can we build sustainability into digital and technology inclusion solutions that are part of universal business design? And um, maybe if you can also sort of like, you know, share how, what Lena Cheshire has been doing with sort of like, you know, tech companies in relation to that. Um, so while Steve sort of like, you know, um, working out sort of like, you know, his response, maybe Caroline, for you, the question is, how do disability its moment in the same way as other diversity strands that have had so um, i'm happy to go to whichever maybe steve you first and then caroline or okay so uh the universal okay um uh, we've touched on pieces of the answer to this i guess um technology is what it is we need to it is where it's at right now and the future of technology and the exponential growth of it and the speed of development of it is vast and we need to be on the inside track we need to ensure that people with disabilities influence the development of it too often um i see discussions happening well after the horse has bolted too often there are people that recognize the the the, the missed opportunity um when actually they should have been in from the get-go around how to deliver on what often is referred to as born accessible born accessible technology and what does that mean it means taking account of the customer right from the outset it means those things around you know understanding for us it means understanding the business that we're engaged with what is it that floats their boat what is it that they see as success and quite often i found that the the best way of engaging technology companies or people responsible for building technologies is making sure one of the issues is translating what we're talking about here into a meaningful proposition for a technology company or any other company um so what does it mean to me uh, you know if my interest is i don't know selling more widgets if my interest is um you know environmental or any other thing how does that link to what you guys are talking to 
and I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us but that's the element that I try to focus on it's sort of if you like getting people hooked into the discussion in the easiest possible way and often that is starting from where they are today it's starting well, what's important to them and how can we link our messaging and so on to and then if you can tick that box um, for organizations then you're in business really because they it, very quickly they immediately get it so that cultural question that we talked about with microsoft um the spin outs from that around some of the work we were wanting to do with them around uh, you know, artificial intelligence and utilizing that ar ar around employment opportunity or creating digital pathways around employment, utilizing social media as new game changing ways for people with disabilities to get into jobs, because actually it means you don't have to physically go to a job anymore. You can do it from home. Well, what are those opportunities? And by the way, let's create those opportunities not good enough to sort of wait for them. The current figures are that over 50% of primary school children today in the West will be doing jobs that currently don't exist. Well, let's not wait for the jobs that don't exist to materialize. Let's create those opportunities and begin to formulate what those uh, opportunities look like. Uh, Caroline. So how do we create um, the disability moment? Um... I think it might be around now. I really do. Um, and I think how we create this moment is actually to work to find a common theme um, and that will join all of us together. Um, look, I, I'm an activist. I'm a troublemaker. I'm a campaigner. I have a big over emotional heart. Maybe I do think with the valuable 500, this might be the business opportunity, not the opportunity, but it's the business opportunity. Um, because I think when you've got the power of these 500 companies and we're starting phase two, so it was never just people would have said, what is it? Was it a tick box or a campaign? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's this, it's a contagion, essentially. It's a murmuration of using this huge, these huge companies of employees and suppliers and talent to actually challenge how we consider humanity and how we consider people with disability. But the other way I think is we should always have our moment in any inclusion conversation. When we talk about gender, what about women who have disabilities? When we talk about Black Lives Matter, what about disabled Black Lives Matter? When we talk about LGBTQ, what about people who have different sexual preferences who have a disability? You know, the disability does not discriminate. We hear that all the time. It's going to touch every one of our lives across sections, every single thing. So let's make our moment in every inclusion conversation as we should for everyone else, because inclusion means everyone for all. But somehow I do think a much more greater understanding of the value of our experience is now. And that is because of what Steve referred to. In COVID, there was this, it, it was like exclusion was mainstreamed and we can't unknow what we know. We can't turn our back on it. We also saw our business systems changed when they wanted to. So it's all about intention. It's about using our voice and trying not to cancel each other out, but trying to meet each other where we're at so we can help each other move forward. Oh and God, I, I think sound, uh, I sound like some sort of <laughs> preacher there. I'm sorry about that. It's Friday. It's beautiful. I love it. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I want to say, I want, I want, um, you, you know, for me, there are numbers and you've quoted a few, Caroline, earlier on. The ones that really stick um, in my mind at the moment are things like 73% of people that lose their job involuntar involuntarily do so um, either as a direct result of an acquired disability or a long-term health condition recognized as such by, uh, in our case, the equality duty. 23% of recruiters of recruiting managers that would care to admit it, bearing in mind in the UK this would be illegal, but park that, 23% that would admit it said that regardless of how equal the proposition was, that they would not, under any circumstances, recruit a person with a disability. Yeah. 
Now, this is a whole bunch of stuff wrapped in there around understanding and cultural norms and whatever. But to Caroline's point, we need to get better and seize the moment around integrating the disability messaging into all of this other stuff because we we are at the moment i mean look at the power of the black lives matter agenda and the messaging that was delivered through that again triggered by the most horrendous for the most horrendous reasons but nonetheless it grabbed imagination actually bizarrely during covid times to yet another kind of weird link back to uh, you know, the state of the nation. And then finally, at the moment, you know, it seems to me that that collaboration and discussion, we've got to, we've, we, we've really got to push hard on that because if anything, especially on social media, sadly, but in many other parts, we're being forced almost into extreme positions on virtually everything, you know, um, you either love Prince Harry or you don't. You're a royalist or you're not. You know, you think Trump was whatever you think or not. That's it. And of course, there are nuances <coughs> and there are things. It, um, what's happening, what's happened a lot of the time is that we're divided. And I think we need to somehow find our way back together and embrace uh, uh, each other, uh, literally and in other ways, um, around humanity and and that wider understanding of who we are and, and and that holistic view of who we are i think the next question i was going to ask is actually touching on that uh steve so you were talking about disability integration being great i think one of the questions is how do we do it do we always sort of like you know have to be forceful and pushy and an activist no. or how do we do it in a different way no you don't and and can i just say i like i don't want to be an activist <laughs> I didn't want this. I just want to get on and live my life. And and actually, I hope I, I don't know if would Steve agree with me, but I certainly know I, I people know I don't give up on anything. But, you know, the greatest part of me is I genuinely ask people to see who I am because I'm I am you and you and you are me. Um, and it shouldn't have to be this hard. Absolutely not. Um, it's it's for me, it's about using our humanity um and appealing tearing apart what separates us and seeing what is the same about us as well as being having our unique difference um bizarrely i think critical elements have emerged at the moment which should act as a jesus i was about a bonding agent anyway what i mean by it is so i'm thinking about for example the environmental agenda if you take something like that um unless you're on a different planet or universe I think in general terms, people accept that if we don't do some serious work here, if we don't pull together, then we're about to screw up the planet. Um, and for me, those are unifying agendas. And one test for, for, for me is, you know, making sure that it's not just environmental stuff that we talk about, now and that that doesn't hijack the entire even important as it is because after all it's the lifeblood of our planet but actually that we take the opportunity to recognize when we're talking about environmental why are we doing this what is all this about it's all about fairness and equity and recognizing each other and uh, bringing people you know giving people opportunities and making sure that people maximize on that because ultimately you know that's where and i I can agree more with Caroline, you know, on, on, on the one level, um, you know, like all of us, I want to live my life, but I'm also dissatisfied because I recognize that um, it could be so very different. I'd love to not be doing this job. So I kind of have to tell you, I am working to get myself retired. It would be amazing that we don't have to have things like the valuable 500 and to the whoever asked that question, you know what, there are days I think exactly the same. Why does this have to be so hard? Why do we have to keep fighting for it? Why do you have to keep coming out of the closet? Yeah, you know what, um, you're right. And so the only way that I imagine is that if we all try to find out what's the same and what we all want at the end of the day, which is human beings, is to be respected, 
to belong, not to fit in, because I don't know who they are that decide who we fit in, and to create systems and co-design them together. Um, Interestingly, yeah. that very capitalist world, um, one, one of the amazing things when you look at the, the brands, the products that do best, quite often their focus, to quote Simon Sinek, uh, is they focus on the question oh, why. Right. Yeah. The, and why talks about belonging. Why is Apple, well, you, you know, Apple is great because it addresses the question why. Why would you even want to be, what are we all about? What are we trying to deliver? Well, we're about to, we're delivering the best product on the planet that you can't do without, the best services on the planet that you can't do without. And that engenders a sense of belonging. It's not, on one level, it's not rocket science, as Caroline would say. It's actually just straightforward playing to humanity. I want to be part of your gang. I want to be recognized as part of this grouping. You make sense to me. And that is a very critical lesson, I think, for all of us around how we engage with other people and how we position ourselves and, and, and engage with um, uh, other entities to, to bring this agenda about. Okay, we got a few more questions, but I don't think we'll be able to get through everyone. So I'll ask the last questions, but then for others who have post questions, we, we should do a quick fire round with you. Yes, quick fire so, round, Steve. We're only allowed to say a sentence, okay? Like, yes. like dare each other. We're both over talkers. A dare. Excellent. Okay. Good. Okay. Go go, quick fire round. Okay. Try this one. So, so in the UK, we have the disability confidence game that companies can subscribe to. It's mainly for Caroline, for you. What are your views on it, and is that enough? Oh, listen, I'm for everything uh, that is going to move the dial. Um, we work at a lot of our valuable 500 companies are also in disability confidence. I want to say best practice happens at small to medium organizations. But the big thing that I think we do need to do is get the companies sharing with each other what works and what doesn't work. So right. creating any community to share best practice and what fails is a very positive thing. Maybe this, this one might be a bit loaded, but anyway, let's try Caroline. So the opportunity to make a business case for inclusion, um, which is sort of what we were talking about. And the question is, can we therefore extrapolate a business case for other excluded groups in society, economically excluded, for example, and should CEOs be encouraged in these areas as well? So it's kind of building on the work that you're doing through Valuable 500 and to see how this could apply to other groups that are excluded. Well, the same, uh, it's a, that is a great question because the same business case that is existing for people with disabilities in its sort of broader sense exists for everything. Because as Steve and I have said, business needs to represent the society to which it operates in. Not because it's just a good thing to do, but if you want to engage with and serve with, serve your customers, and your suppliers, you need to have the talent in your business. And that is regardless of any of the issues of exclusion. And that is not just the ones that we hear, which is gender and race and LGBTQ and now disability, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different, um, different state and marriage. So yes, the same case exists for all. And if I would say- exclude, you, If you exclude a, a voice, then you're going to exclude a customer. I quite. I would. I would exactly echo that. That customer obsession again. You know, it seems to me that is at the heart of a lot of the. And just the thought, really. I'm always a bit astonished that we still, as a society and organisations, talk about customer service, and then we talk about first class customer service. In other words, first class customer service and bog standard customer service. <laughs> and I quite often think, what's all that about? Actually, yeah. inclusion, a lot of the time, can be dealt with very easily. If you travel first class as a person with a disability, what does first class mean? It means human intervention. It means people there to support you getting on and off a train or on and off a plane or helping with bags or helping with getting food or whatever it is. That's first class. Then there's bog standard which is not first class. And I often think that we really do miss a trick um, around, you know, if, if, if we embrace the customer 
and delight the customer, then frankly, uh, and, and you have an understanding of what those customers' wants and needs are, frankly, you're 90% there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve and Caroline. So we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, if there are any other questions that we haven't answered, we'll definitely get back to everyone by email. But thank you, everyone, for attending this one hour session, the fireside chat that we have, and we will have our next quarterly one also coming up soon. Thank you very much for the sign language interpreters, the organizers, yeah. and most importantly, thank Caroline, you. yourself, and Steve. And I just feel like I need to read this from um, one of the participants who said, I have really enjoyed listening, so thank you. You are so right in what you have talked about. I have, unse I have unseen disabilities and haven't shared this in my application nor my appointment. This was absolutely around feeling I would be judged, so thank you. So thanks a lot. I think there have been a lot of messages thanking both Caroline and Steve for the really interesting discussion. So thank you, everyone. And um, yes, and have a good weekend.